Greetings everybody and welcome back to the Aurora Group. This is Juice. So today's video is an introductory episode that is going to be part of a discussion with panel members, uh, with extra uh, partners in the Air Warfare Group on this in future episodes. Uh, so consider this part one of our our shoot on live virtual constructive training as it applies to us in DCS world. Um, and before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what LVC is in the real world. So in the real world, the L is for live, of course, and in the real world setting uh, to use this, it basically means real people using real systems. So that, you know, aircraft, um, uh, radar, uh, threats, uh, EW, it's, uh, you know, along the things that can be stim simulated in a training environment, this is real people doing it, nothing uh, constructive uh, or, uh, or simulated or virtual. Now, in the real world virtual, it basically means that you have real people using simulated systems. Uh, you, simulation consoles, uh, simulated uh, training systems. Uh, in reality, you could even consider something like a Smoky Sam system that you use on the Nellis range to shoot up so that somebody gets the uh, effect as they're flying by to see some smoke trail coming up at them. Give them that thrill. Now, in the constructive uh, in the real world. It's pretty straightforward and it's pretty concise, uh, although it's very flexible in how they apply it, but it's basically simulated people and simulated systems. So this is where they can take and artificially create uh, threats out there in the system with the right type of sensors and onboard equipment to create threats so that you feel like, okay, I see a radar contact 80 miles out, where in reality there's nothing in that airspace, uh, nothing at all. So what about this in DCS world? Uh, for us, you know, we've kind of tailored this to our using, and it, and it seems to work. The model seems to work okay. Uh, the live version of DCS is basically anytime there is a package, whether it be, uh, you know, Vipers, Hornets, Hogs, or Apaches, or anything that we're flying, that is a real person in a real chair flying that module. Now this is, this is, in the real world, this would be considered the virtual element, but in DCS world, we use it as the uh, live element because all of us in the aircraft, no matter if it's a package of Hornets, or if it's an element of F-16s, or a CSAR package of, uh, of Jollies going in for a combat search and rescue exercise or training, or a A-10 support package going up with a couple wingmen or a four ship, now, the virtual in DCS world for us is where we apply what DCS has as capabilities with the AI. So, <clears throat> to give you an example, getting on and off the boat during our carrier cruise, we uh, rely on ATC for uh, getting us on and off the boat. We use the deck crew, the animated deck crew, and all the commands to get them to do what we need to do to hook up and be able to shoot. And then when it's time to come back, we even use the AI um, uh, LSOs uh, when we don't have enough LSOs to go into it ourselves. And this is a feature that we're looking forward to for improvement. Uh, needless to say, for a long time we've been using AWACS in DCS. It's not perfect, uh, but we do use it for situational awareness uh, occasionally when we don't have somebody that's on lot ATC, and I'll talk more about that in part three. Uh, but when we get people that are actually, you know, have the console and the software that we can hook up, we actually have GCI or AICs uh, and other controllers that we can use through that program. And I'll talk about that at the end of this video. The uh, DCS world, this is the cockpit of the C-130. This is the KC-130 climbing out on its way to go do our refueling. Uh, track and, uh, you know, so anytime you're air refueling, whether it's, uh, you know, probe and drogue, uh, probe and drogue or boom stick and receptacle. Um, it's a, an AI bot out there until DCS makes a KC-135 or a KC-130 uh, trainer, which we might get with the C-130 that's coming out. So Now, we also use AI for our threats. Uh, we can set that in different ways in the mission editor. One of the ways we've done it is we've created an independent class with this Chinese bomber in it so that we can go out and fly on them and intercept them and practice escort and practice VID without spooking them. If this was a Red 4 asset, he might, you know, we can even try to set him up where take no evasive action or anything like that, but we basically just made him an independent guy, uh, an, an unidentifiable bogey so that we couldn't ping him on RWR or with SA. So our other aspects that we use is, and, and you guys may have used this 
two is the AI JTAC. When you're going in to do your bombing training uh, or uh, missions, so scripted missions on the ground, you'll notice that you have an AI in there. And again, it's just like the ATC and it's just like uh, all the other stuff that you have available in DCS World. It's not perfect, uh, but it gives you a little bit a level, bit a little bit of simple level of immersion that you can use in DCS World. We've even gone as far as putting in uh, a big shout out to Red Kite for this. He gave me his mission when he did this one. I was able to get his assets and a little on the map to simulate that. So the constructive part is the really tricky part in DCS World. What I like to refer to it as the creative part. And this is where you have full uh, spectrum availability uh, to go outside of the box, so to speak. Uh, what we like to say in, in Banjo, our South Amer our, um, Australian lead down in our Down Under team, uh, came up with this. He goes, you have to push the I Believe button to get this to work. And this is what we do is we, we push that I believe button on airspace. We've, we've, we take ranges and existing information and we actually practice uh, abiding by that airspace rules. We use Moose ATIS to get our information uh, when we leave the terminal and when we're coming back in. And we also use LOT ATC. And we do, uh, we do something kind of unique. Even if we've got somebody flying in the package that's an air traffic controller, they will uh, suit up, get ready, and get ready to take off. And then they'll run us through some LOT ATC stuff and then join us in the air. A lot of times we'll have a check-in with ground, uh, hand over to tower, and then we'll get handed over to approach departure and center if needed, if we're going that far far enough away. But uh, we pretty much stick between ground, tower, and approach. Uh, we use published approach and departure procedures that are available in some of the training aids or some of the navigation aids. Um, you know, but we don't use them all. We don't want to make this. You know, we got a lot of players that are non-real pilots that are uh, you know having doing this for fun to to learn about every VFR and IFR approach and departure coming into Las Vegas. Uh, might be a little painful, a little less fun than just learning a couple of key ones for getting us out. That's why you'll see in our missions we use a lot of the same runways, same uh, weather weather conditions, and same winds. Now, I, I mentioned something about beyond border projection, sort of, where you think outside of the box. And when I say the box, I mean the, the physical dimensions of the map is one of those things. Uh, to give you an example, when we did our en route plan for the arrival mission one to get to the carrier, uh, we came in, simulated that our, our F-18s uh, took off from Spangalum and we air refueled en route off of the Syria map. And then as we got in over Turkey on the Syria map, we basically had finished our tankers and were bleeding off our gas. And we had a couple of tankers for emergency get-me-downs. Uh, and this was before we had the uh, Moose tanker recovery script or recovery tanker script working on the boat and stuff. Uh, here's a picture of... Uh, of Bogey Dope and I flying our F-16s over Fallon Naval Air Station on the Nevada map. Uh, if you fly high enough, this is what you see. If you get down low, it looks all pixelated and everything. Uh, just a, another shout out. Hey, uh, let's expand on that Nevada map and make it really cool. But we uh, we use the outside borders of the map. There's a lot of textured stuff that we can set up targets on this airfield if we wanted uh, so that we can actually practice in-flight in refueling, en route, uh, not just take off and have the target right outside the uh, Las Vegas area in the not, uh, Nautilus range. Uh, some of the stuff that we use on the Nellis map and other maps are the 476 range objects, which is another out-of-the-box thinking. You've got everything in the DCS game, but you have these mods and add-ons that allow you to put other top to uh, objects and targets, and you can even get artificial scoring. Uh, you can get calculations on how far your bomb drop was, and you get that feedback when you drop it, uh, or you can also review it later. Uh, we also use the terrain textures or assets that are available on the map. And these are things that aren't really put into the baked part of the map by Eagle Dynamics. These are things that the satellite imagery has picked up, like fake airfields. This is one of our fake airfields. If you climb up high enough, you'll see the outline of an airstrip and taxiway and a parking apron and stuff. So what we've done is we've actually placed uh, static objects here and some objects to avoid hitting so that we can actually practice uh, collateral damage avoidance uh, on some of our missions. And we, we put, sometimes we'll put real threats where we have people shooting at us and we'll put real radars so we can actually lock them up with our harms and take them out. The Syria map was one of the maps that we wanted to work with uh, during our cruise. So I went out and created on the tip of Cyprus a mock uh, city uh, along with some targets. You can see in the lower left side there, you'll see some targets I have spread out. 
to simulate a convoy out in the desert. And uh, we use this off the boat and go in and uh, drop bombs and everything. And we actually have, you know, we'll get a FAC Alpha or we'll have a JTAC on the ground and we'll have somebody coming in lasing targets or, or, or doing talk-ons during the nine line or keyhole cast. Uh, some of the self-imposed restrictions that we apply to is airspace restrictions and speed restrictions at altitude. These are extra things that DCS World is not going to ding you for unless you program it in to, to trigger that. But uh, pretty much when we're flying over populated areas on our training maps, uh, civilian populace, we evade the speed limit and altitude restrictions. Uh, you know, stuff like, you know, we don't go up into other people's airspace like Baker 17, which is the, the air to ground range, you know, B 17 is what it's called, is the uh, air to ground training range down off of Fallon there just south of Highway 50. And uh, we also look at things like this is in, uh, n you know, in Death Valley National Park, which is part of the Nevada map. As a matter of fact, if you look at the top, you can see the border of the DCS mission editor. Uh, this is on the Nevada map. <clears throat> it's actually, uh, this is on the map map in game. But we can actually see places like the Grand Canyon and Death Valley and all the national parks, which have altitude restrictions and, of course, you know, wildlife restrictions. So we have tried to apply those for a little bit of level of immersion. Uh, like I said, we push the I believe button. Things that we use like uh, third-party apps like uh, combat flight to help plan our missions to give us that extra level of immersion. This is something that's not included with DCS World. Uh, there are free versions of these software packages, but there are also paid versions, which all of us have. Uh, typically, we go over to Tactical DCS about once every three or four months and do a group buy where we get a huge discount for everybody, and we buy about like 80 copies of this and distribute them out. Uh, people sign up and say, hey, I'll take one, and we get them on the list. Uh, Lot ATC is another good one. I don't personally own Lot ATC, but we have a couple of members that do. Uh, Takeda, Gumby, and Tyro do uh, own this in DCS World, and a lot, a lot of times they will play our air traffic controllers uh, in various assets. Tyro is really good at playing our uh, GCI AIC as well as uh, air traffic control uh, from the tower and from ground and from control, uh, control centers. Uh, that is the end of part one, pretty much. Uh, and, you know, I always ask people at the end of our videos, uh, we don't charge uh, advertising dollars or, or anything like that. We don't have a Patreon. We don't, we don't ask you for money. All we ask is if you see something you like, uh, hit that like button and share it with a friend. Uh, consider subscribing so that you're up to date when we drop something like this. And with the end of part one, just want to put a shout out for uh, Banjo and Tyro for helping with the initial discussion of this, uh, gathering thoughts. This uh, this content or this uh, this subject is no long is not closed. It's not uh, finished. We're going to have a few more episodes where we're actually going to talk to people in the real world that have used LVC concepts in their training in the military. Uh, all open source, all stuff that's not classified, uh, things that you can find online. And we'll help you uh, share some of that too. Hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, everybody stay safe and we'll see you in the next video.